Good morning, I'm Denise Elliott with the 3M Company. Thank you for joining me today for some locator training on the Dynatel locator. Each and every locator has a 1-800 number on it. The 800 number is for our service department. If you look in the transmitter here, there's an 800 number and it's 1-800-200-0265. Every single locator has that 800 number on. And that 800 number is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So you have a question and if you're out trying to locate and you're struggling and you're having trouble, just call this 800 number and someone will answer the phone and if they don't answer it, they will call you back. When you call the 800 number, you press four for the emergency help and that's the after hours and someone will be available to help you. So you don't have to stand there and be frustrated and, um, and struggle. You can just call us and we'll talk you through it. We work with customers on a regular basis with locating and uh, we're able to handle those questions over the phone. We know this equipment quite well and we're available to talk to you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So all you gotta do is look at your locator and get the number. Other options for you, we have some online training modules. Those online training modules are available through our website. And also if you uh, Google in or YouTube uh, your, your model number, so you take the model number off your locator and you uh, put that into Google or to a search engine, you will come up with uh, the module, the training modules that go along with your locator that, that 3M did. I don't know how they get there, but they got there. Another option we have is we have distributors that are, that are factory trained and are able to do the training, the locator training for you. So you can contact your 3M representative or your local distribution for a, a training class through the distributor. Another option for you would be to come up to Austin, Texas. We do training classes four times a year. If you go onto our website, you can see when the next coming class is and you can register for that, on, that class in person. It's a two-day class and you let the instructor know kind of what you're interested in and what you're trying to learn and we can kind of tailor the, the class to the folks that are attending. And the final option is um, there's several companies throughout the uh, U.S. that provide locator training. Staking U is one that I've worked with. Um, they offer two-day and four-day classes. They go to different parts of the, the country and do training classes or their headquarters is in Mantino, Illinois. That's an option too. If you need, if you need your folks to learn how to, train, how to locate, you're better off going to a, uh, a training academy for that type of training where our class training is more just about the locator itself. So let's get started. I like to get everyone a little level set on what's going on in locating. I think we all have different ideas of what's happening in locating. So if you look at the screen here, Basically what we do is we have a transmitter. The transmitter is like a power plant. That transmitter is going to send out that signal and it wants that signal back. So the transmitter, you hook onto your target cable. Your target cable is the cable that you're trying to locate. So you clip onto your target cable and your transmitter will send out an AC current, an alternating current. That alternating current will create a magnetic field that travels down your target cable, goes to your far end ground, and travels through the earth or through the dirt back to your ground rod and from your ground rod back to your transmitter. And this creates a, that circuit. And that circuit is what we're locating on. We're actually locating that magnetic field. So if you look at the blue box next to me, there's rings around that magnetic field. So I'm gonna go to the next slide here. So if you look at the, this, this is the front end view. This is the front end view of that magnetic field. And you see that red dot is your target cable. If we were to take a um, and, and number these one, two, three, four, five, six. And at the top here, number them one, two, three, four, five, six. Based on what we know about electricity, electricity goes the path of least resistance. When electricity, or like water, comes to a T in the road, 50% goes right and 50% goes left. So, based on what we know about electricity and the way it attenuates or dissipates, we stick the locator in this magnetic field and we look at the signal with this antenna and then we look at the signal with this antenna and based on the way the signal attenuates, there's a mathematical formula in the receiver that says this cable is three feet, two inches down. So what happens in a, in a perfect world with a nice round magnetic field is very simple to locate. But what happens is other folks come into the trench with you. You know, you're a gas company and then the power company comes in, the cable television people come in, the water, the sewer come in. And what happens is you get multiple cables in the ground. So if you'll take a look at the, the slide again with the green ring, you see that another cable has come into the area. So what happens is that nice round signal that we look for with the magnetic field becomes distorted. 
And so that it, there's not a clear round circle for the, the locator to figure out where exactly your cable is. So the piece of equipment, the locator, and the person becomes confused because you will get readings on both of these cables. You'll get noise over them. And so part of locator training is really kind of understanding when you have a distorted field and how to mitigate that. There's so many, there's so many utilities under the ground and it's just getting more and more. We're getting more utilities in the ground and more folks are going underground. You have your sewer, your water, you know, phone lines, gas lines. We have cable for uh, <laughs> the dog, the dog fences, you know, the electronic fences, sprinkler systems. You have this all underground. And so at the end of the day, this is what the locator sees. This is what the piece of equipment sees. It sees this distorted signal. And so training is about how do we find that target cable and mitigate some of that distorted signal and, and, and truly locate what we came out to locate that day. Different things can cause distorted signal, but at the end of the day, that's what's happening is you have that distorted signal. That's what the locator sees. So we're going to talk about that today. So here's an agenda of what we're going to go over today. And really, at the end of the day, you're a locator. You show up to do a locate. And there's four things you can do. You can alter your ground, you can change your frequency, you can change your wattage, or you can physically move your transmitter. Outside of that, as a locator, you don't have any other tools in your pocket to actually locate. So what we're going to do is we're going to deep dive into these four things that you can do to change your locate. I didn't say that I could fix your locate, I said that I could change your locate. Because when you, when you make differences in your locate is all we're trying to do is try to, to, to make changes to see if we can find it. If that cable is locatable, the 3M Dynatel locator can locate it, and we have different ways to do that. Again, it's alter your ground, change your frequency, change your wattage, and physically move your transmitter. If today's just not your day and you can't, you can't get all of those, if you had to pick one, the one I'd really like you to remember is alter your ground. You could, today, you could be a, a, a better locator just by understanding how to alter your ground to make your locate better. So if you're locating at a level of like a three or a four, I might be able to take you to a four and a half or a five. And if you're a seven or eight, I might be able to take you to, you know, a seven and a half, eight or nine. But I'm not going to be able to take you to a, a full on locator in this couple of hours we'd have together today. So let's dig in right now and start talking about alter your ground. So the first thing we do is we look at the transmitter. So you press the off key. So you press and hold the off key, and it's going to say OK, low, or dot, dot, dot. If it says OK, if it says low or dot, 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 you might want to consider changing your batteries. So let's have a quick discussion about batteries. The batteries will affect your locate. The 3M locator in the receiver has eight AA batteries that are in this housing right here. You need to put them in in the right direction <laughs> for them to work. and put that right down. So you have eight AA batteries. And interestingly enough, I have found that you should use the same manufacturer of batteries in order to ensure that it's going to work properly. In your transmitter, we have six C batteries at the bottom. There's a Phillips screwdriver that you would to loosen this. And it's, it's designed so that the screws stay in, the, in, the, in the, um, the cover so that in snow or in rain, you won't lose the um, screws. They won't fall out and you lose them. So they're designed to stay in that, that cover. There's six C batteries in the bottom here. And then the, the third and final option is we have to get to higher wattages and or just to bypass the C batteries, we have this 12, 12 watt rechargeable battery. It's a lead acid battery that you could use, which would, when you plug this in here, it will bypass your C batteries and you will uh, go and be using this to do your locate. So the first thing we do is we press and hold the on off key and mine says low. So when I put this rechargeable battery in here, I then press the on and off key, and you kind of have to hold it. You kind of got to put a little muscle into it. And it says, you know, it'll say, OK, low, or dot, dot, dot. Also, there's a cheat sheet in the lid here that's going to give you, you know, if it says, OK, low, or dot, 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 how good of a ground, you, you know, how your batteries and how and, and what's happening with the locator. I apologize. The second thing we do is we, check, we press the second button which is the ohm key. So if you look at the screen over here, and you have the first, the first button here is we press and hold the on off key, and it says OK low or dot, dot, dot. The next thing we do is we press the ohm key. The key looks like this with the toning, the fault finding, or the ohm key. And right now, we're going to focus on the ohm key. So what we do is we press the ohm key, 
and it puts a little, so what it does is it moves the flag over here and there's a little ohm key and now a flag shows up right in the ohm screen. And it's gonna give you an ohm reading of between about a zero and a 10. It's gonna be a, a zero, between a zero and a 10. And what this is, is ohm is a measure of resistance. So based on what your ohm is, is kind of how we set our frequency. So let's talk about that. The resistance, I wanna talk about resistance. So if you think of like a river of water and you think of a rock in the middle of that river, the bigger the rock, the more resistance. That rock is your resistance. So the bigger the rock, the more resistance. So if you have a rocky soil sand condition, a sandy condition, the signal is your signal that you're sending through that alternating current's gonna struggle to get through the rock and the soil, so we might have to use a higher frequency. I've created this cheat sheet that says based on the frequency that you, that you based on the ohm reading, you select your frequency. This is a small little one, I made it homemade. It's got um, my tech service and our, my phone number at the bottom, and it fits right in your transmitter. It's a good little cheat sheet to keep in there. If you need these, we can get these for you. So the first thing you do is you check your ohm. So I'm gonna come over here and say, all right, we checked our ohm, we, we, we checked our battery, we checked, we pressed the ohm key, and it came up with 8K. If you look at your cheat sheet, your cheat sheet's gonna say, based on an 8K, you'd use a frequency of 33K. So what could we do? Let's just think about ohm, and let's think about conducting electricity. How could we better conduct the electricity to get that ohm key to, a, to get the ohm reading to like a zero, one, or two, a more respectable range for locating. So we, there's different things we can do, um, you know, and, and let's just talk through them. So one thing we could do is, everybody says let's use more metal. <laughs> um, if you didn't call 811 and you didn't call before you dig, I don't want you sticking a big ground rod in the ground with lots of metal and going really deep. You could p potentially hit a cable below and someone could get hurt, and it's just not worth it to me because if you go from an 8K to a 6K, it's not a significant enough drop in the ohm reading for me to justify you hurting yourself because the main thing is at the end of the day, we all want you to get home to your families, so don't just stick a ground rod, a big, huge ground rod in the ground as deep as you can to try to get more metal in there. It, it just It's not safe, and it's not worth it. So the next option would potentially be to use water. Water's a great one. Water's a great conductor of electricity, you can just pour you know, your cup of coffee or some Gatorade over your ground rod, and just by adding water alone, you can get from that 8K down to the 2K, 2K, and that puts you in that respectable range of the zero, one, and two to be able to use a lower frequency. The final, the final option, and it's not the final option, but it's an option, is we recommend a shovel. The nice thing about the shovel is it has a nice wide blade. It's like a catcher's mitt for that signal coming through the dirt. And so by, by Clipping on your direct connect cables to that shovel, you can clip right onto the shovel, but you want to make sure you have metal to metal contact. So if, you're, if your shovel has um, paint on it or it's corroded, you may want to have to dig it around or some folks will take like a wire brush and scrub it. But you clip this right on to your, to your shovel and then use the shovel as your ground rod. Why I personally like the shovel is because it's got that little lip and I don't have the body strength that a lot of folks do to locate. So I can get over the top of that shovel and push my ground rod in maybe a drier condition where I need to get down in there. And everybody has a shovel on the truck, so it's perfect. So let's talk more about altering your ground. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna draw a couple pictures here for you because altering your ground is more than just adding water and using a shovel. So here's the house we're trying to locate. I am a great drawer. That's my target cable. Here's my far end ground. Here's my transmitter, which is clipped onto the house, and here's my ground rod, okay? So what happens is the signal travels down through the target cable to the far end ground. I'll put my far end ground up here. Here's my far end ground. Travels to the far end ground, and then it travels through the earth, and it's, it's connected to, it, it, it's being drawn to the ground rod, and the ground rod will take it from the ground rod back to the transmitter to create that circuit. That's a nice, perfect signal. If the ground rod is, uh, if, if, if you have another line in the, in, in the way here, so now you have another utility in the, in the joint trench area, what could you do to, to remove this? This is my target cable here in the center, and what I wanna do is I don't wanna see that cable anymore because it's causing that distorted signal that we talked about. What I can do is I can physically move my ground rod to the other side. So I can physically move it so the signal is gonna travel down through the cable around 
back to the ground rod and come in this way and it will make that cable disappear. That's what we talk about like when we're looking at different ways to, uh, to, to get that signal around and so it's easy to locate. Another situation occurs where we can have another competing. Now I've just made it more difficult and I've added another one and I have more cables in the ground. So from a setup perspective, personally as me as a locator, if I get this situation where I, I find out I have a distorted signal and later in this discussion we're gonna talk about how we know there's a, a distorted signal. But if I have this distorted signal, the setup I'm gonna always use is I'm gonna call it special peak. I'm gonna put it in 577, which is my lowest frequency, and I'm gonna increase my wattage to three watt. So that's the setup that I use in this situation. But let's put that aside for a second, but that's kind of the setup I want you to kind of remember. Um, but we're gonna come back to that. But if I have a situation here, what I want to show you here is, let's say this cable is the most important cable in your network, and you need to find this, this, this pipe or this cable. Let's just say it's the 911 line to the city, and if, if, if this gets cut, people won't get help that they need. It's the most important line. It's a high-profile line. I never said that you couldn't create that circuit above the ground. So what you could do is you could take your ground rod and move your ground rod down to the bottom here, and so that you're far in, from your far end ground to the... To the um, Ground rod is a very short distance that it has to travel. And then what you could do is just jumper this above the earth with you know, a tracer wire or a, a, you know, a speaker wire, some sort of cable just to conduct it above the earth. There's nothing to say that you couldn't clip here and clip here and only have the cable itself underground. And that's another way to, to take out that distortion to, to truly find the cable you're trying to find. So altering your cable it, excuse me, I apologize. Altering your ground is thinking about how can I create that circuit? Folks that are electricians have an easier time grasping locating because they think about that circuit. They think about that electrical circuit all the time. So when you're trying to locate and you're getting and you're getting reads that you don't want to get, you got to come back and think about how can I how can I alter my ground? Can I physically move my ground rod? Can I add water? Can I should I use a shovel? You know, can I move stuff around or can I go above the ground, okay? So I'm gonna come back to this, um, this setup later in the, in the cast, but I wanted to make sure that I was started covering up quickly the setup that's, that's, that's best. So here's, coming back to the agenda, I like to come back to the agenda because I like to repeat myself and it's not, <laughs> my stepsons think I do that, on, I don't do that on purpose. I repeat myself on purpose because it's a way for you to remember. And the most important thing today, right now, is for you to re and remember to alter your ground. And if, you, if I ask a question, the answer usually is alter your ground. So when you alter your ground, you, you look at the signal path, you check the resistance, you look at the signal path. Based on your ohm reading, you set your, you set your frequency based on what the ohm reading is. But you want to get to the lowest possible frequency by using a, a shovel or adding water and maybe going above the ground. So now we're gonna move into bucket number two. So the four ways to change your locate is alter your ground, change your frequency, change your wattage, and physically move your equipment. So why does it matter how good? So now we're coming back to how good of a ground. It matters because we choose our frequency based on the resistance in the soil. So that ohm reading tells us a lot about it. A lot of folks have located for quite a while and have never used the ohm key. They just pop it on and put on 33K and go locate. And that's fine if, you, you, uh, if you're having no trouble. What we're talking about today is really troubleshooting. If you're comfortable at 33K and you can locate at 33K, then that's fine. But what we're talking about today, I'm not gonna change who you are as a locator, but I'm gonna give you some troubleshooting tips. And when you call me and ask me to help you with the locate, I'm gonna ask you, What's your ohm? What frequency are you using? What are you trying to locate? I'm gonna be asking you those kinds of questions because that's how we troubleshoot. So I'm gonna go down here and show you. Here's the cheat sheet that I, I, I showed earlier that you couldn't see very well. But the cheat sheet basically says, based on the resistance or the ohm reading, you select your frequency. So if it's zero through two, you could go with a 577 or a 1K. My preference is always to go to the lowest possible frequency. If you have an 8K, Excuse me, if you have an ohm of 3K through 6K, go to 8 kilohertz, 7 through 10, 33 through 82. So let's talk about frequencies for just a minute. Frequencies are AM and FM radio stations. So you just pick a frequency out of the, I don't know what it's called, but out of the frequencies, 
And your AM stations are really small signals that travel really, really far distances, and they hold on and they don't bleed off. They stay on for a very long time. So it, in the middle of the night, if you're listening to um, a radio station and it's a clear night, you could pick up an AM station in Denver, Colorado, unless you're in Denver, that this doesn't go as well. But you could pick up a radio station in Denver, Colorado, but during the day when there's airplanes and there's lights and there's cars, you're not gonna be able to pick up that AM station. So AM stations are really small frequencies that travel very far distances and they're less likely to bleed over. High frequencies, your 33K would be considered your FM station. Your FM stations are big, fat, huge signals that are sent out over a city and they die off or attenuate pretty quickly. They're, they're fat and they're big, but they die off. So as you're driving on a road trip, you know, you're on your AM station and you get in the city, you can pick up that radio station and you can, you know, hear it for pretty clearly, but pretty quickly after you leave town, that AM state, the FM station dies off. An AM station you can pick up and you can hold that quite a bit longer. And that's because of the size of that signal. So think of your low, like your 577 and your 1K as your AM station, and think of your 33K as your FM station. Okay, so let me look at the next slide with you. So low frequencies are skinny and long, they travel further, they're less likely to, be, to bleed over, and they're susceptible to resistance. But you need a good ground, you need that ohm to be low, you know, you need a good ground, uh, a good soil conditions, maybe a damp, you know, good soil conditions. High frequencies are fat and short, they travel shorter distances, and they're more likely to bleed over. They're less susceptible to resistance, but almost any ground will do. So when you go to the FM station or the high frequency, your 33K, what you're doing is you're pushing out a big fat signal and you're pushing it down to try to get it past that sandy, rocky conditions that's gonna, um, that's gonna impede your signal and not let you get that signal through and get that connection we're looking for to be able to cut, conduct through that. So we have just went over um, changing your frequency. So the advantages of smaller frequencies and they're less likely to bleed over. Again, I'm not here to tell you today to change. If your 33K works and you like it, it works great. But when you're in a situation where you need to troubleshoot, I recommend thinking about how can I alter my ground? Can I add more water? Can I use a bigger piece of metal? Can I use a shovel? You know, can I use a lower frequency? Do I need to use a higher frequency? The next thing I wanna talk about is wattage. Wattage, wattage is a tough one to explain, especially if you're, if you're not an electrician, but Denise's description of wattage is, you know, wattage is like when you're bowling and, you're, and you throw a bowling ball down the alley. How hard you throw that bowling ball down the alley is really what wattage is, and wattage is about brightness. The higher the wattage, the brighter it is. But wattage and frequency are like salt. Um, more is not better, but wattage is, is, is used in certain specific situations. So you'd use wattage in a highly congested area when you have deep locates, you know, and deep locates are like 12, 15 feet. They're not, you know, they're not three feet um, uh, depth. And overhead interference, if you have overhead transmission lines you're trying to locate under, you'd want to increase your wattage. So if you look back here, I was talking about you know, changing your wattage. Whenever you feel the need to change your wattage, to increase your wattage, it's because you're in a deep locate, you have overhead congestion, overhead interference, or you have a congestion. Whenever you feel the need to increase your wattage to three watt, I always want you to put it in special peak. And we'll go over special peak a little bit later, but I want to kind of get it into your head. Whenever you feel the need to increase the wattage, I want you to also put it in special peak. And moving your transmitter, which, Let's go through this real quick. Let me back up and make sure I'm covering and going through the, the locator itself. So we press and hold the on off key. We get OK low or dot, dot, dot. Then we press the button again and, we, and it goes to the ohm key. We get the ohm. We alter our ground and get the lowest possible ohm to set our frequency. When we set our frequency, you can see that the flag goes up to the, the, the top corner there under frequency and we have the 577 in there. So the flag moves from ohm and it moves up here to above that seven, if you can see that. So that's how we set the frequency. So what I wanna do is we come over here and we have our direct connect clips, okay? And it's a, it's a little cheater thing I use because a lot of times in the winter when you have gloves on and it's cold, I use the, direct, the, the thing to open it and I push this down. You wanna make sure that's all the way seated in. So the first thing I get is I get what's called OL here. And I always tell people your, your SOL because OL 
means you have an open line. A lot of folks think OL means overload. No, you have an open line. That means your far end is not grounded. And so you really need to kind of take a look at your connection. Are, do, you have a metal, metal, do you have a metal to metal connection on your ground rod? Are you clipped onto metal? You know, is there corrosion or paint? So you want to check your connection if you have OL. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my, my red and my black and I'm going to put them together. And it, what it's going to do, it's giving me an ohm of zero. So if you have OL, you need, to, you need to check to make sure you have the far end is grounded, you're connected. So I have, I, have an ohm, I have an ohm of zero, so I press the button again. I press that third button, the second green one, and it gives me 577. So then I'm going to step back over to the slide here. So over on the side here of the, of the transmitter, you have this output level. Okay, the, see this output level here? It's a sine wave, and there's a matching sine wave right under the little door there, okay? And so when there's no flag there, I'm in half watt. These transmitters come up to 12 watts. When I have a no flag there, I'm in half watt. When I push this output key, it'll put a flag above it, and that flag will put it in three watt. So it'll toggle between half watt and three watt. Folks have three watt transmitters. If you look in the corner of your transmitter, it'll say whether you have a, a three watt, a five watt, or 12 watt. This particular demo equipment I have here today is a 12 watt. But they all work the same. When I push the, the, the sine wave for output, if there's a flag there, it's in, it's in three watt. And in order to get to the five or 12 watt, I will push it, I will push the output key one more time and that flag will start flashing. In order to get to 5 watt or higher, and we call it maximum output, the FCC regulates how much frequency and how much wattage we can put out. And so if I push the, the output um, level and there's a flag above it, I'm in 3 watt, but, and I push it again, it's going to start flashing, but I'm going to need an external source. We send you a 50-foot cable that can be plugged into your cigarette lighter. You can get to the maximum output that way, or you can use this lead-acid battery that um, can go up to 12 watts. This is a lead acid battery that, that goes with, can go with the 12 watt or the 5 watt locator. It's lead acid because it works really well in extreme heat and it works really well in extreme cold. The thing is, it's kind of got a little bit of a personality disorder because you can't, you can't put it on a tender and leave it on a tender. You can't leave it on a charger for a month. It, 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 it won't work. You, um, you want to charge it overnight, take it off, and use it. And, and use it down and then recharge it. So you kind of want to have a regular schedule for making sure it stays charged. A lot of times folks are like, it doesn't work anymore. There's a little fuse here on it. And if you open this little fuse box up, it's a five, five amp fuse. So if it's acting funny or it's not working, you might want to check the fuse first before you get too excited that something's wrong. That's designed to, uh, to, to protect the battery as long as possible. It comes with a charger. If you need to charge this, you just plug it into the wall and charge the 12 the, the, excuse me, the rechargeable battery. Goes right in there, it bypasses the seat, and it gives you the ability to get up to what we call the maximum wattage, which is between 5 watt and 12 watt. But again, we're regulated by the FCC of how much we can put out. So there's software in here that'll automatically regulate that for you. So I'm going to come back over here and I'm going to look at the screen so you get a better shot of the screen. So if you go, if you go across the top here, when I, press the, when I press the ohm key, there's a flag above ohm, if I press the ohm key again, it's going to put it in fault finding, and the flag's going to move right there. And if I push it again, it's going to put it in toning, and toning's right there. And so that, that button right next to the off button can do all three. Some of you have locators that don't have fault finding in them, so you may just have the ohm key, or you may have the ohm and the tone key, but then it, it wouldn't be able, it would just toggle between ohm and toning, or just stay at ohm depending on what model you have. We have several models out there. I want to explain what toning is um, really more for just, for just your purposes because I, like, I don't like to have buttons on something and I not know what that button means. Toning is an old telephone term when you have a bundle of like copper wire, you have a bundle of wire and you're in a subdivision and you want to know which is which. You can tone one of the cables and then tone it on the other side and you can say, okay, this is cable, you know, address one, two, three, this is address one, two, three, and you can identify them. In the power business, um, we call it phase identification, and folks can use this locator with two couplers to identify um, which phase of the three phase they're putting in to put in safely. We, have, we can talk offline or we can send you offline the um, information on how to do that. 
So you go across the top of the screen here on the locator and you have fault finding and then toning. And then when you put it, when you press the, the third button, which says trace right above it, if you see that word trace there, you push that button, it'll go to 577 and the flag will jump right there above 577. With the 577, there's a number flashing behind it. And it's usually, if I put these two together and clip these two together, that number flashing is usually 103. Um, and if I, if I change the frequency and I put it in 1K or 8K, that, that we call it the relative current. That relative current is going to change. We're going to come back to relative current. But if, you're fi if it's flashing 577 and low, that means you, you have an open out. You have an OL. You have an open line. So if it says 577 low, you need to go and check your connection because you bypassed and you didn't check the ohm key. And if you didn't check the ohm key, you missed that it was an open line. And so 577, it'll flash a number behind it. See, like 577, it'll say 103 or 105 or 106. That's your relative current. I'm going to come back to relative current. Then let's go across the bottom. We have the output key. When we push the output key, it puts a flag above the output, and that puts it in half watt, 3 watt, or maximum wattage. And again, you need that, that external source to get to that. In between the ohm key and the sine wave is a V, and that V is for voltage. So if you look in the lid of your transmitter, and I'm going to read it because I don't have anyone here to read it for me. Check the voltage before connecting the transmitter. Voltage higher than 240 volts will damage the equipment. For standard you know, follow standard procedure for reducing voltage. So what I said was, if you didn't hear, is you can clip up to a live secondary up to 240 volts and not disconnect the power. So if you get a call, an 811 call, you need to go out and do a locate. You don't have to knock on the customer's door and say, hey, Mr. Customer, Mrs. Customer, I'm going to be disconnecting your power. we got to do a locate. You can clip onto a live secondary up to 240 volts and do a locate. And you can put an alternating current on a live secondary. But the main thing I want you to remember when doing that is you need to take this and you need to make sure this jack is seated all the way in. And then you can clip onto a live secondary with your red cable, direct connect cable. And right above the V, it's going to tell you the voltage on that line. It's going to flash like 127, 129. So it's going to give you the voltage of that line. So I want to take one last look at this screen and make sure we don't have any questions and make sure. So it's a left to right sequence. We press and hold the on and off key. It says OK, low, or dot, dot, dot. If it's low or dot, 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 I recommend changing the batteries, especially if it's a really cold day or a really hot day and you don't want to spend all day on your locate. The next thing you do is press the ohm key. A flag will appear above the ohm. It's going to say OL. You need to check to make sure you have the connection. You need to make sure that your far end is grounded. You get the connection. It's going to give you an ohm re reading. Based on the ohm reading, you either set your frequency or you alter your ground. I told you that was the answer to a lot of my questions, is alter your ground. Once you get to a respectable ohm reading, you put it in the, the frequency based on the cheat sheet provided. And then you, you, you leave your, your output, you leave your wattage alone unless you come to a situation where you have a distorted signal and you're in a deep locate, a congested locate, or overhead congestion, you then change your wattage. This slide here, what I want to show you on this slide here is the all button. And <laughs> a lot of people love all. <laughs> what all does is all sends out four frequencies at the same time. So it sends out 577, 8K, 33K, and 200K. It sends them all out at the same time. Using the all button, what it does is each one is sending out four frequencies, but you've just reduced your power on each one by 75%. So you're only running 25% of your power on 577, 25% of your power on 1K, you know, on, on uh, 8K, 33K, and 200K. The all button will prematurely wear out your batteries, but what it was designed to do is if you get far away and you can't find your cable anymore, you can change frequencies which, without walking all the way back to the transmitter. The problem with that, and I would respectfully push back, that if you are you know, a block or two blocks away from your locate and you lose your line, I think it's, more, it's not so much about changing frequencies as much as really spending the time on the setup. For locating, you know, you're in a big rush. It's really hot. It's really cold. you got a bunch of locates to do that day, so you want to rush through. So you're going to jump in, put it in 33K, and you're going to locate. You're going to get three blocks away, and you're going to lose it. I really want you to challenge you to challenge yourself to go back and go through the steps. Check your battery. If your battery is low, you're going to struggle. You know, sometimes 
you know, folks call me and they go, something's wrong with the locator or something's wrong with the person carrying the locator, the locator. And I say, change your batteries and call me back. I can't tell you how many times I've had to go out and change batteries for customers. People send their locators back to 3M all the time to the repair center to change the batteries. We really recommend that you check, change your batteries before you send it back to us with a problem. It's too expensive for us to change your batteries for you. So um, check your battery, check your ohm. You're going to know right off the bat if you don't even have the connection. You could have broken tracer wire if you're locating a tracer wire. You know, that OL is going to tell you a lot about it and get you back troubleshooting and fixing whatever's going on before you get started. Set your ohm key, check your ohm key, set your frequency, and set your wattage. So take the time up front, and then you won't be two to three blocks away and lose your cable and have to switch frequencies to find it. A better use of the all key, for those of you that are more advanced in locating, one of my coworkers teaches, he puts it in all, and when he does his dog on the chain sweep, which we'll go over um, when we get to the receiver, he looks, he locates the line in all of his frequencies and figure out which gives him the best, loudest decibel and the best connection. He'll lock it in on the transmitter and he'll lock it in on the receiver and go locate using that frequency. My preference is to go with the lowest possible frequency based on your own. So the fourth and final bucket is move your transmitter or physically move your equipment, I like to say. So when you locate, and, you're, and, you, and you struggle to find it, it's easier to find the locate when it's not congested. So what I would do is kind of lift your head up and look around and see where the natural ending point of your locate is. So let's just say, for instance, you're locating telephone. I would go out to the telephone pedestal and I would actually do dog on the chain around the telephone pedestal and then I would locate back into congestion versus starting in a congested area where there's other utilities that could cause you to have the distorted signal. So we've reviewed the transmitter, and really the, 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 the main thing I want to focus on is those four buckets, because I, I remember things in buckets. And so when I go out to demonstrate a locator, I go out to do a locate, and I struggle, my troubleshooting, my personal troubleshooting, is I go through these four buckets. I kind of step away from everybody, and I say, okay, Denise, what can I do to alter my ground? Can I add water? You know, can I use a, a shovel? Can I move my ground rod? What can I do to alter my ground to make sure I get a good signal path through. Then I kind of look at my frequency. Can I adjust by using a higher frequency or a lower frequency? You know, I look at wattage. Is this necessary to use a, a, to increase my wattage? Is this a really deep locate? Is this a congested locate? Is there overhead interference causing me not to be able to, uh, to struggle with that? And so I look at those things and can I physically move my equipment or can I just go do my dog on a chain around a telephone pole or a, a pedestal or around the light pole. So those are your four buckets. And I always say improve and I wanna remember and remind you that if it's locatable it's within those four buckets, as long as your batteries are good. <laughs> um, so stop, ask yourself those four questions. And when you call us, when you call Gary or you call me and, and we kind of try to help you uh, troubleshoot through your locate, these are the kind of questions we're gonna ask you. You know, what's your own reading? How good of a ground do you have? What frequency are you on? Have you tried other frequencies? You know, have you tried a higher frequency, a wattage, a lower wattage? Um, did you try to locate into congestion? You know, did you, did you go out and do your dog on a chain in a different area and come into that area? So those are the questions I ask myself, and those are the four buckets, if you can remember those, to ask them or write them down. A lot of folks like to write down those four questions. Alter your ground, change your frequency, change your wattage, or physically move your equipment. So next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk to you about the connection methods. There's three different connection methods with the 3M locator. The direct connect method, the dynacoupler, and the induction. So the direct connect method is the method we've been spending a lot of time talking about this morning. The direct connect method is with your cable, your direct connect cables. You always wanna connect your black cable on the ground rod and your red cable on the cable you're trying to locate. It really makes a difference when you're using our equipment default finding. So as a practice, it's best to just put the black cable on the ground rod and the red cable, here's your ground rod, and the red cable on the target cable that you're trying to locate. With the direct connect cables, you're conducting electricity. We've already talked about that. You're creating that, you're sending an AC current and creating that magnetic field. So when you, like when you come home at the end of the day and you turn on the light switch, you've completed that connection and you have light. And when you leave and you turn off the lights, you've disconnected that connection and you no longer have light. With the, cup, with the direct connect cables, we're conducting electricity down these. 
with the coupler, the Dyna coupler, the Dyna, the, the Dyna coupler magnetically induces the signal down the cable. So it's really a function of access. If you don't have access where you can clip onto the exact cable you're trying to locate, you might have to couple around a conduit or something like that. And so what we do with the Dyna coupler is we magnetically induce. And so we need a high enough frequency in here to be able to induce that down. The Dyna coupler performs best at 33K. A lot of folks, when they're brand new locators and they're taught to locate, the person who teaches them to locate says, put it in 33K and go locate. The reason they do that, there's actually a method to their madness. The reason they do that is because the, the Dyna coupler, the coupler works best in 33K. Um, and the, the, um, direct connect, the direct connect cables work in 33K just fine. Again, I want to go back and say to you and remind you that when you use the lower frequencies like the 577, you get a smaller signal and it's easier, it's less bleed off. So if you're in a congested area where you don't want to bleed off, you want to use that lower frequency. But as far as the, the attenuation or the signal dying off, 33K on a house, when you go out to do a, locate at a house, you're not going to, you're not going to um, attenuate your signal. You're not going to die off um, with 33K. You're, you'll be able to do, you know, a residential locate quite easy. So, you know, I take, I, I say the coupler performs best in 33K. A lot of folks use 33K for both. This module and what we're talking about today is really about troubleshooting. You know, it's about um, what, what to do if you can't find it, if you're struggling to find it. And that's when we start using lower frequencies and different wattages and things like that. As far as button pushing, I'm going to reach back out and push you back to the online training modules. The, the online training modules are about 10 minutes and they really help you with the button pushing. I'm trying to help you understand what's happening with the locator so that you can troubleshoot, but if you kind of forget what buttons to push, you can watch that 10 minute video to get you back um, acquainted with that. So now we're gonna talk about the third connection method, which is the induction method. And that's again, an access point. If you don't have a place, a lot of folks that are doing water sewer locates or pipeline oil and gas locates, they don't have the ability to, you know, to actually clip on. And so what they do is they induce. Pardon me. We have an induction coil here down in the um, going down the back of the um, the transmitter. What you do is you lay the transmitter on your last known spot, the last spot that you knew for sure that you had the line. You would lay the box on the ground and you would you would not connect it with the direct connect or with the coupler connection. Here, let me show you this. You wouldn't use these into the jack. You would leave the jack. So if the jack has nothing in it then you're automatically in induction. You put it at like a higher frequency and it's gonna induce out. So it kind of sends a signal out like a flashlight. So anything in that flashlight is gonna light up. Any metal in the ground from that flashlight is gonna light up. So when you take your locator, your receiver, and you do dog on the chain, just showing you doing the dog on the chain in front of it, you're gonna pick up any metal in the ground. And that's what your induction method is. We have additional information on induction. So if you have questions specific to induction, get in touch with us, we can send you the information or make it available to you online. So those are the three connection methods. So it's the direct connect, the coupler, and then the induction coil. In review on the slide, I want you to take a look. It's just your three methods. And then again, um, the Dyna coupler works, works at 8K, 33K, and 200K but it performs best at 33K. So I would recommend that you um, use it at 33K. So now we've completed the transmitter. We've gone through all the, the, four, different, um, the four different things you can improve your locate, and we've gone through the three connection methods. So next what we're gonna do is we're gonna move into the receiver. We're gonna review the receiver. So when we talk about the receiver, we're gonna talk about the antennas. This material on the antennas is pretty dry material. I'm not expecting you to memorize the, this material and, 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 and memorize it, but what I'm trying to do is get you conceptually to understand what's happening with the antennas in the locator. So let's talk about the peak and null antennas. The peak antenna is a, it, the peak antenna locates perpendicularly. So the peak antenna, let's just pretend that this marker is a peak antenna. We call this tires on the road. The peak antenna is going to is, works like tires on the road. Okay, and it works perpendicularly. So if I'm locating on a line with my peak antenna, if my cable starts to go off to the right or to the left, the peak antenna is gonna lose it. It's not gonna be able to see it, okay? The null antenna is called a tornado. We like to say it's a tornado. 
the, t the null antenna is getting a 360 view and it's looking at the cable in a 360 view. So we tires on the road, tornado. That's how we locate. We're using the peak and null antennas. So what we do is, I want to, to look at the, the receiver here. And here's, these are our peak antennas, and this is our null antenna, okay? So what we talked about, I'm gonna come back over to the slide here for just a second. We looked at the signal. So we stick the peak and null antennas, we stick the peak antennas in that signal that's attenuating. That's our magnetic field. And we stick the antennas in there, and the bottom antenna, which is the special peak antenna, it's a, it's a peak antenna, looks at the signal, and then the next antenna in the middle also looks at it, and based on the way that signal attenuates, we figure out where the cable is and how deep it is, right? And so I put the peak and null antennas here because what we do is we look at the signal in peak and we verify a null, and if the peak and null antennas do not line up, our, if our peak and null, I apologize, if our peak and our null are aligned, our signal is round and we can put down paint. So let me kind of draw a picture here for you. So what we're doing in locating, it's, it's about sound. So this is peak. So this is your peak antenna. And then I'm not a very good drawer, but you can get the notion here. And there's my null. Here's the target cable that I'm trying to locate here. Do you see this? I'm trying to locate this cable right here. And here's my magnetic field, right? So your peak antenna, and here's those directional arrows that you guys all just love these directional arrows because they just tell you what to do. Um, they tell you which direction to go. So here's peak. So what I'm doing is I'm using the perpendicular, I'm using tires on the road to come across it. And if I look at my decibels here, it's going to be decibel 68, 72, let's just say 99, 72, 68. So what happens is as the locator comes over the, over the cable you're trying to locate, the decibels are going to increase and it's going to get very loudest at the top or the peak of the, the peak of the signal. And that's when your arrows are going to come together and everyone's going to be happy and smile. But then what I want you to do is I want you to verify a null. A lot of people don't use the null antennas. The null antennas are the most amazing antennas. I love the null antennas. The null antenna is the lack of response. So when you were in school in science or biology and you did an experiment, you did the null response. The null response was the lack of response. So what happens in the, in the, with the null antenna, it's actually kind of the opposite. Just for purposes of, let's see, 72, 68, 72, 99. It's really, it's really actually goes down to zero. I apologize. The null response is the lack of response. So I look in the peak antennas and I verify a null. If my peak and null are in alignment, my signal is round and I can put down paint. Okay? And so this is the perfect world. This null antenna, when they first invented locators, when they first invented locators, they actually started with null, null antennas. And what the null antenna does is it spins around in a circle and it looks at the cable 360. And so when folks would locate, they would take the receiver and they would run it across the signal and go no, noise, 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 quiet, noise, noise, noise. Well, I think the human brain just can't get around the fact that there's no noise, therefore there's a cable there. So then they introduced the peak antenna and they said, okay, it's quiet, louder, louder, loudest, louder, louder, you know, quiet. It's a bell-shaped curve, and that the loudest point is the peak or the center of the cable. And so the, the brain can get around that. But over the time, it feels like people have gotten away from the null antenna. And the null antenna is a great tool, and it really helps you confirm your accuracy. So what we do is we, we locate in peak, and we verify a null. And so we cross it in peak, and then I put my foot on the ground right where I find peak, and then I put it in null, and I locate in peak and make sure my peak and null are in alignment. If my peak and null are not in alignment, what do I do? I alter my ground. So let's take a look. Let's get back on the screen here. And in this particular screen here, this is where my peak and null are not in alignment. My signal is not round, and I cannot put down paint. So I need to go back to the drawing board and alter my ground, change my frequency, change my wattage, or physically move my equipment. So this is kind of the slide that I drew on the, on the, the uh, board, but as you can see, one of, the, one of the downsides of, of null is that you're going to get a null here, a null here, and a null here. So you're going to get a null response in all three of those. So it's going to be quiet, loud, 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 quiet, loud, 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 quiet. And so you want to use peak and null together. At the end of the day, 
peak looks at the top of the signal, null looks at the bottom of the signal. If they're in alignment, your signal is round and you can put down paint. If they're not round, you have a distorted signal and you need to go back and you need to alter your ground, change your frequency, change your wattage, or physically move your equipment to kind of troubleshoot through that. So I'm going to show you the next screen here. As you can see, the locator is in peak, and it's got a decibel of 73. 577 is your frequency, directional peak, and then there's the, uh, the 97 decibel. If you look at the screen next to it, it's null. It's looking at the bottom. And you can see that arrow there. That arrow there is like a compass. It's looking, it's looking 360 for your cable. So when we're doing a traditional locate, and we're, using, we're doing the dog on the chain, let's say you're walking along and you lose a cable. Before we talked about you know, being a block or two away and losing the cable. So what happens is your decibel drops off. Your peak antennas, um, let's say it's 97, and it's not 1 to 100. So you know, don't always look to get it to 100. It could be 78. But when you get to your decibel um, and, you're, and you're, you're walking along and you lose it, it drops off. Something happened. You know, there's alerts you. There's something different. Something's changed. You know, I'm at 97, 96, 97, you know, you know, 78, and it drops off to 22. You lost your cable. What you do is you step back to the last time you actually had the cable and, and, had, and you knew the cable was there, and you do another dog on the chain, and you see, did your cable go right? Did it jump? Is there a fault there? And that you jumped the fault so you lost your signal? Or did it go left? And once you find it, you go there and you keep locating. So the way to use the null antenna is to, you know, you're walking along and you're, you're, you're locating and locating, 78, 82, 78, 82, 22, your signal drops off. What you do is you hit the null antenna and switch it to null, and I'll show you how to do that, but you switch it to null, and that null antenna is gonna do that 360 view, and it's gonna give you an arrow and say, hey, dummy, your, your cable went that way. If you come over here, you find it, you keep locating. So the null antenna, you know, a lot of folks just, just don't use the null antenna, and it really gives you confidence in your locate. You know, when you put down paint in a locate, you're, 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 putting down, you're, you're putting down that that's safe to dig. And again, I go back to safety. When I think about locating, it's safety, and it's about making sure if I put down paint, I have a high degree of confidence that I'm on there. So before you put down paint, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check my depth. I'm going to check my current, which we're going to get back to, and I'm going to uh, check my peak and my null. I want to make sure my peak and my null are in alignment, my depth is about right, and that uh, my relative current's within 12 points of the transmitter, which we've, we'll come back to. But I want to make sure we get the peak and null down. So don't, don't, um, don't, don't miss the use of that null, because it's going to give you a lot more confidence in your locate, because it's going to give you an arrow to go that direction. And when you pick it up, it's, it's actually, if you look at the, the screen, it's going to go to the highest number. But a lot of folks just focus on that arrow in the middle, and then it lines right back up. So we're talking about peak antennas. A peak antenna, a peak is a peak is a peak. So what I'm going to do right now is talk about special peak. Earlier in our discussion, we talked about a setup using special peak. What special peak does is special peak turns off all the antennas except the very bottom antenna. And this is used when you have deep locates, congested areas, or overhead congestion, like overhead power lines that you're trying to locate through. So if we could um, if we could come back here, we talked, we talked um, earlier in the, in the broadcast about the, the best setup that when you felt the need to increase the wattage, I wanted you to put it in special peak. So special peak, what it does is it turns off all the antennas except this bottom antenna, so it gives you a straight shot in the ground. And this is a really nice feature that I don't think it's utilized enough. So I challenge you to go out and test your locator and, and use, use special peak and see what it does for you. When you use special peak, you're going to lose these. I know you guys love these directional arrows that tell you which direction to go, but you're going to lose those directional arrows when you go into special peak. And what you're going to be doing is just looking at the numbers. And truly, the numbers tell the story. But if you can get used to it, um, it's, it you, you get a more accurate locate. Um, I, it's just, it feels more, it's a more accurate and more precise. It's clean when you cross over peak with the special peak because it's turning off all those additional antennas. So special peak, 577, and increase your wattage. So this is, happens when you have a deep locate, you have a congested locate, or you have overhead interference. This is the setup best to do that. This is a good troubleshooting locate setup for you. So I just wanted to show you that we have directional peak, directional null, special peak. If you see right above the, no, the mode where it says special peak, and then right above in the next one it says um, induction peak. 
an induction peak, it's just when you're using that induction coil. So you would do like a two-man sweep or you do induction. And again, if you have questions specific to induction, we can take those offline. We have other sales tools to help you with, with induction peak. Now what I want to talk about is the gain button. So the gain button is like a telephoto lens on your locator. Um, these locators, these 3M locators, have a manual gain. So you can up the gain or down the gain however you want to do that. And the gain button is in the bottom here. All right, here's your gain button. But it's a one-touch auto, excuse me, it's a manual gain. Some of our older locators have one-touch auto gains, but um, these newer locators that have the, um, I call them crosses, that have the wings on them, these wings on them um, have a manual gain so you can gain it up or gain it down. Gain will get you in trouble if you're not, if you're a newer locator. Um, it, the gain button is like a squelcher button on your walkie-talkie um, or a telephoto lens on your camera. It's really kind of used in an area where you're trying to search and you're trying to do a search so you want to, you know, increase the sensitivity of it to try to pick up that something's there. But when I locate, I try, if you could step over here with me, when I'm locating, I have, I have a bell-shaped, oh gosh, you can't see very well there. If you don't mind, let me flip this page here on you. So when we locate, we have this screen here. I like to keep my gain at about there, okay? When, when you increase the gain and the gain comes up to here, what you're doing is you're oversaturating it. So you would gain it down. And you can see, like in the screen before I was showing you, it had a gain of 60%. You would decrease the gain and bring it back to here. And as all it's doing is oversaturating. But honestly, for me specifically, I don't really care to listen to it. And so um, I keep that gain down. But once you start to do your locate, you don't fool around with your gain. Your gain is really for a searching. And once you find the cable, lock in your gain and go. Don't be moving your gain around because that could give you a false sense of security. The gain button, I've seen folks that are newer and locating that have lost the cable and they up the gain. And when you up the gain, the locator itself will get louder. But, that's, but the number itself, that decibel is not changing. And that decibel is telling you where the cable is. The, the higher the decibel, the, the shallower the cable is too. So you can tell how shallow or, or deep a cable is based on that decibel. And so a, a 97.3 is going to be a shallower cable, a shallower cable than like a 78 or a 68 um, decibel. But what happens is you get locating, and let's say you lose the cable and it turns right or it turns left, what people will do will up their gain and the locator will get louder and they'll just keep putting down paint. And that's a bad locate. It's, there's, there's, you don't have comp I don't have confidence that you have confidence in your locate when you're using that gain button that way. So when you start out, put it back over here and then leave it. Find what you're doing and leaving it. But let's say you get over the cable and you oversaturate it, then you can back the gain down. A lot of times we use our 3M markers. We really use the gain because it gets oversaturated and we back that back down um, in the markers. But in locating, if you're not listening to the sound, you can ignore where that's happening. Different folks use different sensories to locate. Um, I understand from some um, people who do this all day, every day, that you're, you're hearing, you adjust to hearing. When you cross over peak with your locator, you, your hearing can pick it up quicker than your eyesight. So a lot of the really good locators are, are listening for the change in the locate to know whether they're on it or not and put down paint. So I don't want to digress too much, but I want to make it clear that the gain button can get you in trouble because when you hit the gain, you're increasing the sensitivity of the locator. It's going to make it louder, but it's not necessarily going to put a cable under your feet. And so I don't want you to put down paint. So there's other ways to check that to make sure that it's there. So let's take a look at the receiver functionality. So you have the left and the right arrows. So you, 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 you know, you're swinging the cable. And what I don't want you to do is swing it back and forth. You kind of want to hold it, um, hold it steady over the cable or excuse me, over the target cable, and you're going to get arrows telling you to go left or to go right. And then when you're over the top of it, you know, both of your, your cables are going to come together, okay? I'm going to kind of go through what the setup looks like, all right? We find our target cable. We clip our red lead onto the target cable. We plug our black lead onto the transmitter, okay? We check our ohm. The first thing we do is that we check our batteries. We check our ohm. Based on the ohm reading, we alter our ground to get to the lowest possible ohm reading so that we can use the lowest possible frequency. We get an ohm of 0, 1, or 2. 
we set the frequency at 577. Earlier, I discussed that the 577, there was a 103 flashing behind it. What that 103 is, or 106, or 95, is the relative current. The relative current is the current that's going through this cable, okay? Um, so this is kind of a cheater. So if you've been kind of asleep for most of this, I'm gonna wake you up right now and say, hey, I'm telling you how to cheat in locating, so this is the time to pay attention. So the relative current is what's flashing behind that 577 on your transmitter. So what I do is I take that, I'm just gonna say 103. You've got a, a relative current of 103. I take my locator and I do my dog on a chain, right? I do the dog on the chain on my locator. I locate and peak. Remember, I locate and peak. I put my foot down. I switch it to null. I verify a null. My peak and my null are in alignment. Then I hit the depth button. On the depth button, it's gonna show me the depth and it's gonna show me the current next to it. So if you have your locator in front of you, if you could please press the depth button, you're gonna see the, the depth and then right next to it, you're gonna see current. And then you're just gonna have a little eye next to it with a circle around it. So the current that shows up on there has to be within 12 points of what's flashing on your transmitter. So it's gonna be like a, a, a 97 or a 103. And so that's the way to know that you are on the cable. Depth is something else. Depth is something, you, you have tribal knowledge about your utility. You know from tribal knowledge about where stuff is buried. Like you could send me out to do a locate and I'm not really sure. You know I know power and gas try to be at about three feet and I know that you know cable television's um, quite a bit shallower. But at the end of the day, you have tribal knowledge about your network that I don't have. But that's one piece of the puzzle when you put down paint. So you locate and peak, you verify and null, you check your depth and your relative current. If all four of those feel right and are right, then you put down paint. What I want you to do is take your locator and I want you to press the depth button and write in one of the yellow keys in front of the depth button. It's gonna either say live or it's gonna say one shot. If it says one shot, one shot means when I stop and I hit the depth button, I, it's gonna give me the depth and the current and it gives me 18 seconds and it's gonna switch back over, okay? If I press that yellow key, we call, it the, we call it the soft key, the first yellow key, and I put it in live, it's gonna give me running live depth and running live relative current. Sometimes we kind of search to zero in to find it. If our depth isn't working, our relative current isn't working, we might move it around a little bit in live depth to kind of find out where the cable is. But in one shot, you get one shot and it goes back to your locate. I get lots of calls from folks that they have it in live and don't realize it and they can't figure out how to get back to their locate and they get frustrated. So I would recommend, if you're new to this, just put it in one shot. You, you hit the depth button, it's gonna give you the relative current and the depth, and then in 18 seconds, it's gonna switch back over and you can keep walking. So you're just kinda of doing your check, check, double check as you're walking. Okay, and I just wanna make sure you got those, those four things. I wanna check and peak, verify a null, check my depth and my relative current. If all four of those feel right, then I can put down paint. So let's go back to the slide here kind of a summary slide on locating. And it says, you know, look at the signal strength. You know, look at your bar graph. Make sure your bar graph is coming up. You know, are your directional arrows over the top of it? You know, you paint and peak, but verify and null. <laughs> so now I'm gonna move into the receiver operations. So if you look at it, and you know, we have newer models that are a little bit different, but they should be pretty easy to kind of tell the difference. Um, in the 2273, we have the, con the 2200 series, we have the contrast button there. In the newer models, the 7000 series and the 2500 series, we've buried the contrast into the, into the menu. It's got the backlight, the light to turn it on, the on-off button, the volume button, the menu button, and then the gain. We've already reviewed the gain. We've already reviewed the locate, you know, the okay to locate is just is getting started. So kind of take a look at those and make sure you're comfortable with all those because we've reviewed those. Now what I want to do is move to the next slide. Those yellow keys we call soft keys. That's the stuff that I had just mentioned that we have the soft key there. And so it's in 577. And, and then it's in directional peak. And there's my depth. In the 2500 series and the 7000 series, the depth key has been pulled out and it's actually in the far right-hand corner of the locator. And then alert on. That's for three on marker balls. If you're, you can be locating and looking for marker balls at the same time. So that alerts off when we're in directional peak and that 60% is our gain. We're at 60% gain. So if we wanna change our frequency, I'm gonna to move to the next slide. 
the thing we do is we press the soft key under the frequency, that 577. If we want to change the frequency, we press the soft key under it, and then what happens is we get the new screen next to it, and we have the option of the active. Putting the 577, 1K, 8K, 82K, 200K, putting that frequency on a line is you're actively, you're actively putting a magnetic field on that line. The other way, other way to locate is in passive 60 hertz. So that sec second button that says power, that's 60 hertz power. So you're looking for the harmonics of 60 in the ground. So for instance, um, in the United States, we do the harmonics of 60. So it's 60, 120, 180, 240. So anything divisible by 60 is locatable in that 60. We have 60, 60 high, and 60 low, which are just the different harmonics of 60. And, and for those of you who use it, I know you know what I'm talking about. But we do the sweep in 60, 60 high, and 60 low. We do our dog on the chain in all three of them to figure out which is the best one, which gives us the loudest decibel. And then we lock in on that 60, 60 high, or 60 low. But that's a passive locate. We call that passive because we're not using the transmitter. We're only using the receiver to locate in the harmonics of 60. So if I can come back to the screen, when I press that second key under the word power, whatever's highlighted when I hit OK is the screen that I'm going to be in. And so you press the, the first yellow key. It says 577. You press that key, and then it's going to give you that new screen. And then you can either press 577 below it, and it'll scroll through all your frequencies. Or you can press the second button, which will put it in 60, 60 high, or 60 low. You can lock that in and say OK, and then the screen will show up in the new frequency. If you take a look at the video, the online video, it'll show you how to do that. So this is just a screen showing you, showing you null. And I said verify and null. And this is what it looks like is that arrow goes to straight up and down when you're null, when you're, you have a lack of response. So it's going to give you a compass. It's going to do that 360 going back and going around um, in the null response. I'm going to skip over the induction. We've talked about induction again. I think that's something we'd want to talk offline about because that's a little bit more in-depth discussion. And I wanted to try to keep this short and really to the, the, the folks that use the majority of the functionality. So we talked about the receiver. We talked about the depth and the relative current. We talked about the importance of matching the current to the transmitter. Whatever's flashing on the transmitter, we want to be within 12 points of the cable that we located in the ground. If we're not within 12 points of the cable on the ground, our current, when we hit the depth button, our relative current, and what's flashing on the transmitter, we need to go back. We need to do a sweep. We need to look at altering our ground, changing our frequency. We need to find the cable, either by doing the dog on the chain and seeing where it went, or going back to our four buckets. We use our peak and L antennas. We look at the signal strength. And we don't want to abuse gain. We want to be really careful about gain. We don't want to oversaturate the signal. We want to keep the gain button back down a little bit. So I got a little quiz for you, but since you can't answer me, I'm going to help you with the quiz. So I'm showing you a screen now, and I'm not telling you what utility you work for, but I'm going to ask you, what, you know, what's your target cable? Is it the red or the green? And I'm hoping that you're saying, well, Denise, you're not giving me enough information. I need more information. So I'm going to give you a little bit more information to answer this quiz. So I'm going to let you look at the screen. So I have two different cables in the ground. And I'm getting two different readings. I'm in 577. I'm in directional peak. And I have a decibel of 85 and I have a decibel of 97.3. Which one is my target cable? Again, I'm hoping that you're saying, scratching your head and saying, well, Denise, I still need more information. So we, brief, we briefly touched on this. So I really want to bring this point home. Is a shallower cable will have a stronger signal than that of a deeper cable? Check your depth and compare the line current with the relative current reading on your transmitter. So based on what we talked about. So decibel alone is not going to tell the story of which cable you're locating. You want to check your depth and your relative current to compare because you want your current to be within 12 points of what's flashing on your transmitter. I hope that makes sense. I'm going to switch to the next one. So now I'm giving you the information you needed. I had you press the depth key. And if you see, the depth is 48 inches. And the relative current on the transmitter is flashing 87. And as you can see on the actual receiver, I'm looking at the relative current of 85. Now I want to point out that under that 85 relative current on the receiver, there's a 29.30 MA. And that's milliamps. Some of, um, some of the other locators in the old days, they used to do milliamps. And they used to do their dog on the chain and search for the highest milliamp. 
Um, we've put the milliamp below our relative current because some folks are more comfortable using milliamp and that's just fine. But what we do with the current is we have the relationship between the transmitter and the receiver when we're doing the dog on the chain to find the ground. So if you said that the red one was the target cable, you are right and you passed the test. So we're gonna go into just a quick summary and we're almost there with tricks and tips and then we'll send you on your way. So from the transmitter perspective, you wanna check your battery. You wanna hold the off button. Again, you gotta hold it down a little bit. You know, Don't be afraid to give it a little muscle. You wanna check your battery. You wanna to connect to your target. You wanna measure the resistance. That's that ohm reading. You wanna measure the ohm reading. How good of an ohm reading do I have? How do I lower that ohm reading? You go back to alter your ground, change your frequency, change your wattage, and physically move your equipment. So when you're measuring your equipment, selecting your frequency and selecting your wattage, it's all part of the troubleshooting. But just to start out with, you're gonna go 577, you know, you're gonna, and you're gonna do the lowest wattage. But then you're like, well, there's overhead congestion, you're sticking your head up and you're looking around, and you're, you're saying, oh, you know what, there's gonna be some overhead interference there. This is a really congested area. I see, I see meters, like I see a gas meter, I see a water meter, fire hydrants, you know, telephone pedestals, um, you know, a, electronic dog fence. You have different things that are gonna cause you to, um, to have a bad read. And so what you wanna do is then make the adjustment and put it in, I'm gonna flip this back down for you. Special peak, 577 or uh, three watt. Increase your wattage to three watt. That's that troubleshooting piece. On the receiver, we press um, cable pipe locate, select your frequency which is your 577, 1K, 8K, 33K, 82K, or 200K, and or we could go into the passive modes, the 60, um, 60 high and 60 low. That was that first, that first yellow key. The second one, select your antennas. If I wanna use my peak, my null, my special peak, or my induction peak. But remember, peak is peak is peak. They're all tires on the road, and null is your, is your um, tornado that's got that 360 view of the cable. You know, um, detect your target path, you do your dog on the chain, look for your highest signal, you locate and, and peak, you verify a null, you check your depth and your relative current. If all those feel good, you put down paint and you start your locate. To finish in your tips and tricks, improve your ground, use a shovel. We went over that when we were trying to get that, get that down to that zero, one or two. Always use the lowest possible frequency. Lower frequencies, are skinny and narrow and they travel far, far distances and they're less likely to bleed over. Beware of multiple access points. You know, take a look. Uh, there's common sense that I can't teach you. I can kind of teach you what the locator's telling you and kind of what's going on underground, but I can't teach you to lift up your head. What else is out there that's gonna cause my, me to struggle with my locate? So take a look at that. Um, high profile cables locate from both ends. So locate at both directions to make sure, because that's an important, a high profile cable is you know, a cable that could, if it, if it was hit um, inadvertently, it could hurt someone. So you wanna make sure you locate that from both directions and both ends and make sure you got it. Always verify a null. We talked a lot about null today. I challenge you to start using null if you're not already using it. We t okay, and the next one is locate into congestion rather than out of congestion. Again, it's easier to be on your cable and stay in your cable going into congestion then start in a congested area and locate out. So what I'd like you to do is if you're in a congested area and you have a lot of things going on, look up and see where the cable's gonna go and locate back into the congested area. It's easier to stay on it. Use your depth and your current readings to verify your target. We talked about that. You check your peak, you verify a null, you use your depth and your relative current to make sure before you put down paint. Don't put down paint if you don't know. This is a safety issue and if you're not comfortable, you know, you need to escalate your locate. I don't know the policy that your company has, but if you, if you locate and peak and verify a null, check your depth and your relative current, and they don't feel right, then you need to stop and escalate it because we don't want to put paint down if we don't, if we don't have a high degree of confidence that that's exactly where the cable is. And finally, trace all your cables to the logical termination. If you start out on a power line and you end up on a telecommunication line, you are not on the right cable and you need to go back. So that's it for today. Thank you so much for your time and paying attention. If you have any questions, please contact us directly. Again, on every single one of our locators, we have our 800 number, which is 1-800-200-0265. You're welcome to call us and we'll help troubleshoot you through the trouble. We have cheat sheets available to you that you can download offline. 
or we have our online training modules. We're there to help you. We want to help make this easier for you and transition in and, do, and be more comfortable with your locator. Thank you again. Have a great day.